Okay, so last day before spring break, I know you're, you're hyped up. Well, actually, it's not the last, it's the last day for me, probably not you. All right. um, so just to recall, we obviously won't meet next week, and then the following week we meet just on Tuesday. It's all on the schedule, okay? And I mentioned, I think yesterday, that we're going to do the projects differently than I had planned. I'll give you three problems. One, this is my plan. I haven't executed my plan, so the plan could change. But I plan to give you one problem in statistics, one problem in linear algebra, and one problem in differential equations. Um, and to make the descriptions pretty open-ended, it might be something like this. Here's a data set describing blah, 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 blah. Do statistical analysis on it. Because that, that, I don't want every group doing exactly the same thing. Okay? You can work in groups of four. And uh, so there'll be no need to come up with a topic. Because, as I mentioned yesterday, talking to a couple of groups, n seemed no, not even a single person had a topic. <laughs> okay. So when you're 0 for 105, you begin to wonder maybe if you're, you're d walking down the wrong road there. So um, I'll come up with a plan. That way you can have a well-defined, or at least reasonably well-defined problem to work on. Um, and they'll be due again the last day of class, but there'll be no need to define them. And I'll try to get those up. Um, I'm sure you have nothing better to do during spring break, so I'll try to get them up if I can earlier in the week if you want to start looking at it or whatever. Okay. All right. So today we shall talk about something called least squares problems. So it's a very general problem throughout applied mathematics um, that have to do with solving a certain kind of problems, which I'll describe. And I'm going to start by doing that by talking about, and of course I forgot the battery for my pointer for the 12th day in a row. Not very. Actually, I'm pretty smart, but I'm not very, um, I'm not, I'm not very focused on certain things like getting batteries. All right. So I'm talking about this idea of generalized linear systems. So this can be sets of linear algebraic equations for which the system is not square. So we might have more equations than unknown or more, equi or more unknowns than equations. Okay. And I'm going to use this concept of least squares minimization, which I'm going to introduce as, again, very general concept that you can use throughout the rest of your lives, I guess, um, to show you how you, you solve these particular problems of non-square linear systems. And then I'll use these concepts to go <coughs> sorry, through um, solve two separate problems. One we've already solved, but from a statistical standpoint, remember we did linear regression. You calculated variance and covariance. Okay. So we're going to do linear regression now, but from a linear systems theory standpoint, or linear systems approach. To, to deriving the equations for linear regression, and then I'm going to go on and talk about polynomial regression. So, I don't know how much data fitting you guys have done, but typically you f try to fit a line to data, and then if you're like, it has some curvature, maybe you try a quadratic, you know, and so that's what I mean by polynomial, higher order than linear. And I'll show you how to solve both those problems within the context of, of um, these linear systems approaches. All right, so this is what we're talking about now. And if you, if you look closely, you've seen this before, but if you look closely at the equations there, you'll see that I'm no longer going to assume that we have the same number of unknowns as equations. Okay? So n is the number of unknowns, and m is the number of equations. Okay? So the matrix A now has m rows for the number of equations and n columns representing the, the unknowns. Okay? So generally speaking, at this point, we'll assume the problem can be non-square. Okay? If it's square, we already know the answer to this problem. Okay? By square, I mean m is equal to n. And if that's the case, we know that we have the same number of equations and unknowns. And if we have a case where the determinant of the matrix A is 0, I should have made that a boldface A, but if the determinant of A is non-zero, um, then we know a solution exists and it's unique and we learned how to find it. Okay, we can compute the inverse, we can do Gauss-Jordan elimination, we can do Gaussian elimination, things like that. Okay, so that's all, pretty much all we've talked about <laughs> for the past two weeks, I would say. Um, on the other hand, you might have one of these cases. So M, if M is greater than N, then you have more equations than unknowns. And if you have, for example, two equations and one unknown, generally there'll be no answer to that problem, right? Because you can't satisfy two equations with one unknown, okay? So generally, systems like that have no solution, at least not in the sense we've talked about. Okay? Um, if you have an underdetermined system, that means you have more unknowns than equations. And in that case, you have an infinite number of solutions, okay? which is not desirable too. So, so the question is, for the problem that's overdetermined, I'm going to generalize and tell you what I mean by a solution to a, set of, a system of equations for which there's more equations than unknowns. 
And for the underdetermined problem, it's a little bit different, right? We have, we have solutions, but they're not unique. So I'm going to pose a problem to give you a unique solution out of that. Okay? So that's the basic framework. And so these are off. This, and this material is not in the book for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, so these are called generalized linear systems or non-square linear systems or whatever you might like. Okay? And so I'm going to pose a way to go about solving these problems. Okay, so let's talk about the first problem first. <laughs> by definition. Let's talk about overdetermined systems first. Okay? So this is the problem. We have AX equal B. Okay? So by overdetermined, we mean we have more equations than unknowns. Okay? So be something like this. Crap, I only want one unknown. Sorry. That screws up my life. Okay, I should have left that up there. L let me try this one to make it a little more interesting. I'm making this up. It has no real purpose, okay? Okay. There's a system of three equations with two unknowns, right? So you've got three equations, you've got two unknowns, x1, x2. And unless these equations are redundant, right? So if these equations are all linearly independent of each other, then there is no solution to this problem, right? There's not an x1 or x2 that's going to satisfy all three equations unless there's only actually two equations, which means these equations are redundant or they're linearly de um, dependent in the sense we've talked about. So the question is, what do I mean? It, let's say I want to solve a problem that looks like this, okay? Which I, which I do, and I'll explain why I want to practically in a minute. Um, what does it mean to solve this? Okay, so I know I can't solve them exactly. So we know also that I can take this system of equations and write it like this, right? AX equals B. And at this point, the A matrix is going to have three rows because there's three equations and it's going to have two columns because there's two unknowns, okay? And so I know I can't satisfy these equations exactly for the reasons I just explained. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to solve them as close as possible. In other words, I'm going to try to make AX as close to possible as B in a, in a least square sense I'm about to define. Okay? So if you can't make AX equal B, make AX as close to B as possible. That's the idea. Okay. And this is the technique we're going to use when we do linear and polynomial regression. We take the solution to this particular problem and apply it to those two. Okay? All right. Now I'm going to kind of go slowly here because I think in the past this has proven to be a little bit um, difficult for people to follow. So if you have any questions, you should feel to uh, <laughs> fail to interrupt me. Feel free to interrupt me. All right. So what I'm going to do is to find something called epsilon. Okay. Epsilon is the difference between AX and B. Epsilon is a vector, right? For this problem here, it would be a three-dimensional vector. It's the same, it's same dimension as the number of equations. Okay? So basically, I'm just subtracting the right-hand and the left-hand side of the equation, and I'm creating a vector called epsilon. If epsilon is a vector of all zeros, you've satisfied the equations exactly, meaning the right-hand and the left-hand side equal each other for, for all three equations. Generally speaking, that's not going to be the case, as we just described. Okay? So epsilon is a vector. Okay? And you might imagine it's, it's a vector that represents the air in the equation, right? Each component of that vector. So for this problem here, you would have an epsilon. It would be a three-dimensional vector, and it would have components epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3. Okay? So you might imagine you'd like to make this epsilon vector small, right? Because that small means it's close as possible to satisfying the equation. You certainly don't want to make it big, okay? So that means that if we want to make this epsilon small, you have to have some measure of what small means. And you have to have some, uh, some measure of what a size of a vector is, right? And that's where the norm comes in that we talked about last time or Tuesday. Okay. So I'm going to define the size of epsilon to be the, that, um, you remember we defined this quantity last time or anything. I'll just write it in terms of epsilon, the 2 norm. Okay? The 2 norm means you take the first component, square it, take the second component, square it, 
until you get out to the last component. And then you add up those, those squares and then you take the square root. That's called the two norm. Okay. So obviously the two norm squared is just this thing without the square root, right? Just that thing there. Okay. And what I'm saying up here is that's equivalent to epsilon transpose times epsilon because epsilon, just for simplicity, let's just say we have three components here. Okay, right, epsilon transpose, we generically write vectors as column vectors, so transpose means it's a row vector. And then we multiply that guy times this. We talked about this earlier when we talked about multiplying vectors and things, but so if you multiply this, it's going to give you a scalar, it's that row times that column, and it's going to be that, right? So in other words, this thing and this thing, they're, they're the same thing, right? So I can write it epsilon transpose epsilon if I choose, which I often do, or I can write it as the two norm of epsilon squared, they're the same thing, they're just the sum of the squares, okay? And you might imagine if, if this represents the error in the first equation, this represents the error in the second equation, and that the third equation, I'd like to make this sum of squared errors as small as possible. Because that means I'm, getting, I'm doing the best I can to satisfy the equation. Okay? So you should have learned from calculus um, the way one does this, and I'm erasing this because it continues to disturb me. Um, I wonder if you can get paid to go around classrooms just arbitrarily write stuff on the class on the boards for some startup company, whatever the melon might dot com might be. All right. Um, so now what I'm going to do is argue that this epsilon transpose epsilon or equivalently the two norm of epsilon squared is a measure of how much error I have, and I'd like to make that as small as possible, right? So this notation here, which I'm pretty sure you've not seen before right here says I would I'm going to I'm just going to this just a definition what's that thing called is that phi capital phi okay yeah. what yeah. yeah okay okay so I'm just defining capital phi it's called the objective okay it's going to be equal to it's just easier than writing e trans you know epsilon transpose epsilon all the time but this is just a definition what I want to do is make this thing as small as possible and I'm going to do this by trying to choose the appropriate x that's what, this, that's what this notation means. So, in other words, I've defined a, me a measure of how much the error is in these equations. I'm going to try to make this error as small as possible, and what I can do to make the error small is pick up what the x should be, right? Now, of course, if the problem is square, we just take these equations and solve for x, right? But if the equation's not square and we have more equations than unknowns, then we're going to formulate the problem like this. Pick the x vector that makes the sum of squared errors as small as possible. Okay, that's my definition of close. That's what I mean by close. Okay? Now, let me see up there. Okay, so I don't really need to write this because I already have it all written up there, but if you, so if you look, you see originally I defined epsilon to be ax minus b, so if I want to minimize Epsilon transpose epsilon, that's equivalent to the quantity I've written on the right hand side, right? Because epsilon is equal to ax minus b. So I can just substitute that in there. Because if I want to minimize a function of x, I need to express the function as a function of x, <laughs> right? So that's what I've done in, the, in that step there. I've just written this objective, psi, phi, whatever, um, in terms of um, ax minus b. So it's ax minus b transpose times ax minus b. That's a scalar, okay? It's going to end up being a scalar. Okay, well, you should have learned this in calculus or some class, that if I have a function, if someone says you have a function of x and they ask you to minimize it or maximize that function, the first thing you should think of, you know, you have some function of x, you want to minimize or maximize that thing, take the derivative with respect to x and set it equal to zero, right? That's what we always do. That'll give you an extreme point, minimum or maximum. And so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm proposing to do here, okay? I'm going to take this thing here, and I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to x, I'm going to set that equal to zero, and then I want to solve the resulting equation for x, and that's going to be my answer, okay? Now you might say, uh, there's something a little weird about this, and it's certainly new, and that's that psi, is that right or phi? I'm so sorry. Help me out. What is it? <laughs> 
Pi. OK, hold on. OK, for future, my future reference. So every time I see that symbol, I can say phi. All right, so phi is a scalar. That's fine. But you see, I want to take the derivative of that thing with respect to a vector, not with a scalar, because right, x is a vector. It's not a scalar. So this is something I'm pretty sure you don't know how to do. You don't know how to take a derivative with respect to a vector. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to do it real quick. So but this is the quantity I want to do. So conceptually, it's just like you've always done before. You have a function. It depends on x. You want to minimize this function with respect to x. You're going to set, take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and then the resulting equation you'll solve for x, and that'll be the answer. <coughs> the complication here is once you buy into this whole definition of how I formulated the problem is how do you take the derivative of this with respect to x? <coughs> because x is a vector. OK. So I happen to have an entire book that has weird formulas like this. It's called the CRC Handbook of Mathematics. Have you guys ever seen the CRC Handbook of, ma of like chemistry and physics? It's got like every known piece of, it's like this thick. Do you guys even use Perry's Handbook? Do you know what this is? OK. So that's one class they go, never heard of it. I'm like, never heard of Perry's Handbook? <laughs> They'd be like, well, I know, OK. I don't want to get into religion. But there's an analogy that would have to do with scripture. OK. So. Um, I guess I just did. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a this is uh, just take this as a definition. There is a derivation underlying this, but I'm I'm not going to try to to derive this for you. I'm just going to give it to you and use it. Okay. So this is exactly the derivative I want to take. Right. I want to take the derivative of this phi phi, which is a scalar with respect to x, and phi is defined to be this quantity here. So that's the exact thing I have written here. There's this quantity, that whole thing there is phi. I want to take the derivative with respect to x. And I'm just telling you that's the answer. I'm not going to try to drive it, OK? It's 2 times a transpose to the times the quantity ax minus b, OK? So it's just what it is, all right? So in a, one of the smallest leaps of mankind ever, um, I write this equation. Because that thing is phi, so I just rewrote it in terms of phi instead of this big quantity. And you get this. And you want that to be equal to 0. Now I'm going to solve that equation for x. And that's the x that's going to satisfy these equations as closely as possible in the, in the sense I've described. And I'll give you an example in a minute. All right. So you have this equation here. Right. So at this point, just treat this thing like an algebraic quantity, which it is. So you have this equation here. You want to solve it for x. Uh. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I can divide through by 2 and get rid of that, right? And then on the left-hand side, I can have a transpose a times x. And then I can move the other term to the right-hand side, which is just a transpose times b. And you get that equation right there, OK? That's a famous set of equations called the normal, normal equations, OK? And now this looks like a problem that you could conceptually solve. So first of all, first thing you have to understand is a transpose times a is, is square. It doesn't matter what the dimension of a is. a transpose times a is always square, right? Because the dimension, the dimension of a generically is what? m equations and n unknowns. And then a transpose necessarily has the other dimensions, n times m, because you're switching rows and columns. So that means if you take um, a transpose and multiply by a, this has the same number of columns as this has rows. So that's going to work out. And then a transpose times a is going to be a matrix, and it's going to be n by n. OK? So it works out. Um, of course, that doesn't guarantee, that just proves it's square. That doesn't guarantee the inverse exists. It depends on the matrix A transpose times A. So I'm assuming when I do this that this is true. So I'm taking this quantity that multiplies A, and I'm multiplying on the left-hand side by the inverse of that, on this side of the equation and on this side of the equation. That leaves only X over here and leaves that on the right-hand side. Okay. So instead of it being a matrix A that's square, it's a matrix A transpose times A that's squared. Square, but otherwise, same kind of thing. OK? All right. So to solve this, for this to make sense, obviously, this matrix can't be singular, or this isn't going to work. And people often call this matrix over here, this whole thing that multiplies b, the left inverse matrix. OK? All right. And so this solution is the solution, for example, 
would be the values of these two x's that make the, these equations solved as closely as possible and the sum of the sum of squared errors. So in other words, if once I find my x1 and x2, there'll be a certain error here called epsilon 1, right? And the same thing for this equation and this equation. My objective function, recall, was to take these, square them, and add them all up. There's no x vector that makes the sum of squared errors smaller than the one I just found, okay? So this is my definition of what it means to solve an equation that has more, a system of equations has more equations than unknowns, okay? So let's just see how this works. We'll go over a simple example. So it looks a little something like this. So you have three equations. You can see them. Um, and we have three, um, sorry, two unknowns, right? So the matrix, it's just like this problem in terms of dimension. All right, so all I want to do is implement that equation. I simply want to calculate this because I've proven this is the answer. So to do this, first thing I have to do is form A transpose times A. Okay. So this shows you this all works out. So there's the A matrix. If you transpose it, it looks like this. You switch the rows and columns. Multiply that times A. And then you'll get a 2 by 2 matrix. It's boring to go through all the details, but obviously I got the number 9 here by multiplying that row times that column, and I got the number two by multiplying that row times that column, and so on and so forth. So it'll be two by two matrix. So it's the same dimension as the number of unknowns. Okay? So there's my matrix. Now, if I would like to find the solution, then I have to compute this. So I have to take the inverse of that matrix, multiply that times A transpose, which is right here, and then multiply that times B. Okay? At this point, I didn't do all the details. I mean, I did it, but I don't show it. So it's easy to find the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. You have to do some matrix multiplication. When you're all done, you get minus 1 and 17. Okay? All right. So if you don't see that, you could, you could check. Um, you, could do, you, could perform <laughs> you could perform the calculation if you like. Okay. So the thing about this solution is this solution doesn't satisfy any of the equations. Okay? So for example, if I take these equations, like the, the first equation is this, right? It's x1 plus 2x2 equal 25. If I plug in the x1 and x2 that I got here, the answer is 8. Right, because we already admitted there's, you can't solve them, so that's what you get, you get 8, okay? For the second equation, if you plug in the solution, which is this is the second equation, you plug in that x1 and x2 I found right there, you get 10, and for the third equation, you get 8, okay? And then if you take these, um, well, that was the second equation, that's the third, but whatever. If you take these things, square them, add them up, you get 200. Okay, big, <laughs> like, whoa, okay. My, here's my claim. There's no x that exists that can make this thing smaller than 200. It's the, it, there is no other x that makes it any smaller. It's the best x you can find, assuming your goal is to make ep epsilon squared small, the norm of epsilon small, okay? All right. So we're going to use this um, later when we talk about how to solve um, linear regression and polynomial regression problems. All right. Are you guys getting tired, by the way? Not of my class, just in general. People are like, yes. And I said, in general, they're like, no. Because <laughs> you guys look fatigued. You need spring break, maybe, huh? All right. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you think, okay, the class looks pretty bored out there. I'm sure it's not me. So then you pose a question for which you know you're going to get the answer you seek, and then you feel better about yourself. Okay. All right. Um, okay, here's the, here's the next problem. So in this case, we have um, a, set, a, linear, a set of linear algebraic equations, but now we have more unknowns than equations. Okay? More unknowns than equations. So there's an infinite number of solutions, and what we want to do in this case is, to, case is try to find some unique solution, okay? So, okay, so if there's an infinite number of solutions to this problem, which there is for this case, then I have to decide what solution I want to find, okay? Because obviously, if I can solve the problem, I want to solve it. I just want the problem to become unique. So what I want to do, and this is my choice here, is I want to find the smallest x that satisfies those equations. Okay? So if I have, if there's many, many, in fact, an infinite number of x's that'll solve it, I want to find the x that's the smallest that solves it. Why? Because that makes the answer unique. You know? I guess you could try to find the biggest x. Okay? 
<laughs> I wouldn't recommend that one, but anyway. So this is my definition, okay. So now, as usual, if I want to do this, first thing I have to do is define what I mean by small. What does small x mean? Well, as you might imagine, I'm going to use the norm of the x to, to measure its size. So I'm going to choose to minimize something that looks like this, okay. It's just like the case I did before, but instead of using epsilon, which is the air, I'm going to use the value x and try to make that as small as possible. So again, I'm going to use this one half thing is just an artifact. It doesn't matter. Just everyone writes one half there. You might say why? It's because when you take the derivative, two comes down, it cancels the one half, and it's not it's not a core issue. Okay, just whatever. One half won't change anything. You can put any number you want there. Okay. So I want to minimize this x transpose x, which is the same thing as the two norm squared. And in other words, if x is a vector that, for example, had three components like this, then x transpose x, which is the same as the 2 norm of this squared, is just going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, okay? That's a measure of how big x is, and I want to make, I want to find an x that satisfies the equation, but I want the sum of squares to be as small as possible that does it. That'll make the solution at least unique, okay? All right, so I pose a problem that looks like this. So again, this is my objective function here, right? I'm just, it's called phi, okay? And I want to minimize phi, and my, my definition of my objective is just what I said, make the, make the x vector in terms of its norm as small as possible, okay? But obviously, um, this is not enough by itself just to try, to try to find the x value that makes this as small as possible because the actual, if that's the answer, if that's the question, then the answer is x, the zero vector. That makes the, nor that makes the norm as small as possible. You've got to also find the one that satisfies the equations, right? Like you're not interested in small x vectors that don't satisfy x equal b. So I have to minimize that, but I have to sure, make sure whatever solution I come with also satisfies the equations. Otherwise the solution is stupid. <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, okay? Okay, so this says minimize this objective, but make sure that when you do so, you impose this set of e constraints, right? It has to satisfy these equations, otherwise it's not a legitimate answer. Okay, so this is different than the problem we had before, <clears throat> and it's harder to solve because this is a minimization problem, but it's subject to constraint, this constraint here is subject to thing. So that's called a constrained minimization problem. And uh, I don't really have time to teach you how to use that. I think it, it's, it's in the book in some way. Um, not, not this problem, but you can, it ends up, you can take a problem like this, convert it to a problem like this that we solved previously using something called Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange is another famous mathematician. Surprise, okay? Um, and so I'm just gonna give you the answer, but that's, that's the problem formulation and I think at this point, um, it is a good idea to try to understand, even if you don't understand right away, why this makes any sense. But if you go through all this um, gyrations of introducing these so-called Lagrange multipliers and do this minimization, you'll end up with this answer. I, it's too much work to derive and too much machinery to introduce just for this purpose. But you end up with this, okay? So again, it looks uh, kind of similar to the answer we had before. Um, Again, if you look at this A times A transpose, that'll guaranteed to be square. I'll show you an example. It's just like for the other problem, A transpose A was guaranteed to be square. For this problem, A times A, a transpose is guaranteed to be square, okay? So square, that's good. Hopefully it's inverse exists. For this solution to be well-defined, it has to, okay? And this whole thing that multiplies the B, people usually call the right inverse matrix, okay? And people often call this the minimum norm solution, okay? So in other words, you've got more than one solution, in fact, an infinite number, and you're trying to find just one, you're finding the minimum norm, the x that makes the norm as small as possible but satisfies the equations, okay? All right. So let's see how to use this. So here's a little example. So what do we have here? We have two equations. And we have three unknowns. And obviously there's an infinite number of ways to satisfy that. But to get a unique answer, the minimum norm solution, I'm going to use the formula I just gave you. To use that formula, I have to first form A times A transpose. So that's what I do. 
take A, multiply it times A, transpose. It's going to be, again, a 2 by 2 matrix. Mention is a number of equations, so it's an M by, N matri M by M matrix always. So at this point, I'm just hoping you know how to multiply matrices. Okay, I'm not going to, but if you, you, can, you can see two rows, this one has two columns, will be 2 by 2, and I'm telling you that that's what you get. Okay? And then to get the answer of the minimum norm solution, you take the A transpose right there, you multiply it times the inverse of this guy, which again is easy to find because it's 2 by 2, and then you multiply it by B, and then you get that answer there. Okay? And if you look, if you were to plug in these, this values of x1, x2, and x3 into these two equations, you would see it satisfies them both. Okay? That's good. What you'd also find, well, you wouldn't find this, but I'm going to argue this, there's, there's no x that satisfies these equations that has a smaller norm. I mean, that's how we derived it in the first place. Okay? So you could spend your whole life looking for an x that satisfies these equations that has a smaller norm. I wouldn't recommend it, because first of all, it's a stupid thing to do. And, and, and second of all, it doesn't exist. Um, but there is, no, there is no x vector that has a smaller norm that will satisfy the equations. Okay. So you understand what we've done. In the first case, we took a, we took a problem that had no solution and, and kind of specified what we meant by a solution in terms of satisfying the equations as closely as possible. In the second class of problems, we took a problem that had an infinite number of solutions and made, it, made, a, made a single solution. Okay. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through how to use these methods to do um, linear and polynomial regression. Okay? Sorry. Okay, so you, you, you might recall we did the whole, you know, from a statistical standpoint we did linear regression, right? It involved calculating things like variances and, co and covariances and correlation coefficients and all this, okay? So this ends up giving you the same, it may not be obvious, but it gives you the same results, but it's, it's from a non-statistical viewpoint, just from a linear algebra perspective, okay? So here's what I'm going to try to do, and the notation's a little different than the statistical part, but I'm sure you'll, you'll understand. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform a bunch of experiments, right? Typical thing is I have something I can adjust, then I measure the result of that experiment. That's called the input, that's called the output, right? And then I do some number of experiments. So I represents which experiment I do, and I might do n of these experiments. So for each experiment, I have a matching value of u and y. Okay, u1, y1, u2, y2, and so on. Okay, the results of the experiment. I look at the data. I suspect that the data can be described like this. Okay. Implicit in all this is th that I changed the value of u and got a new value of y, and I think that the data should fit a relationship that looks like this. Why do I think this? Either I have some underlying principle I think is true, or I just looked at the data and it looks linear. <laughs> so I'm going to give it a shot. Okay? So what I need to do is I need to find these alpha values, right? This is the slope and that's the intercept. And we learned how to do this st statistics, now we'll to learn how to do it with linear algebra. Okay. So this is down here, I'm having trouble with my cursor. This is a regression equation, meaning, um, so the hat, I think we've introduced this before, but hat means prediction, okay? So if I tell you y i, I mean the true value of y. If I tell you y i hat, I mean the prediction of y. The true value of y comes from the experiment in this context. Um, the predicted value of y comes from this model 